influenced my decision to join the National Guard was the fact that I really didn't have a stable home background at that point in time. I wasn't, I really didn't have a, a place to stay. Uh, I was working, I was kind of staying from here to there and I happened to be working at a, a little pretzel stand in the Francis Scott Key Mall and when I was talking to the recruiter, they guaranteed me that I'd be able to get paid for getting some training and that uh, I would be getting some benefits and that influenced my decision greatly. When I think about um, what was a good choice for a black woman at that time, I'm not really sure that it ran through my mind that I'm a black woman and I, you know, should I join the military? I think what was driving my decision at that time was money, food, <laughs> shelter. Um, but just one of the experiences that I had at my AIT was I ran into an NCO. At that time, you had, used to have to show up for pay. And I, re, you know, I had to report for pay. And it was, I want to say, maybe my first paycheck during AIT. And that NCO looked at me and said, I don't want women in my army. And therefore, you will not be here long. <laughs> that kind of threw me for a loop. I mean, I really didn't know what to say other than being scared in my shoes. I mean, I was an E2, and I was really, really you know, scared at that point. And so I actually ended up having a conversation the very next day with the, um, the uh, a Commandant Sergeant Major. And just because I would see him every morning, and he kind of knew that there was something wrong, because I was really shaken up by that comment. And believe it or not, it was that Sergeant Major that really made a, a difference for me at that point telling me that I had every right to be wearing the uniform as that guy. And believe it or not, that guy was removed out of our um, area. I think for me, I felt like, you know, the Army, that environment, right, being in the Army National Guard was, was going to do well for me. I actually went away for what we now call the RSP weekend. But that RSP weekend, you know, it wasn't like going to the buildings and things that you see today. We were out and, you know, we got shelter halves and we spent, you know, one weekend out in like a parking lot in like Hagerstown, Maryland. And uh, that was like my experience and I thought that was so cool and I went for it. Some of my initial military experiences and obstacles that I, I think about and I think what's helped shaped me, um, I think, I ended up having um, AWOL problems, so as when I was enlisted, I ended up having AWOL problems because I, at some point I was a single parent and it was a choice between you know, who was gonna watch my daughter and um, you know, me going to drill and then sometimes I didn't have a ride to drill. Those were very challenging years because I think people seen me as in, well, you know, she's not a dependable soldier, but those who really knew me knew that I was having a lot of challenges and issues and so it was just, it was very, very challenging during that time. So I had to get through that and to really rebuild my reputation uh, as, as you know, kind of a, an enlisted member of the organization so that they would have some faith in me to be able to continue to promote me so that I could move ahead. So that took a while uh, for me to be able to rebuild that. The first sergeant that I was working under at the time was extremely supportive. I mean, he allowed me to be able to sit down, and, and I kind of seen him as almost like a father figure. And he was just so wonderful. His name was First Sergeant Graham. I will never, ever forget him because he kind of had that one-on-one -on -one talk with me that really made the difference and said, look, you know, I know things are challenging, but you just need to keep pushing. You need to keep trying. He's like, you're a good soldier, but you just need to get yourself together. And if you need a ride, you ask someone. Having that personal touch, just being able to talk to the soldier can make the world of difference. Things have changed significantly. If I just look at the organization overall, we're starting to see more uh, diverse leaders at the top, which I think is extremely important. And, and that's if you look across all services, that's if you, if you even look across civilian organizations and at the numbers of CEOs that we're seeing. And I mean, we're in a, a time where we, f we have our first African-American president. So I have seen things change significantly, but I have also been very blessed in that I did not have any, any racial issues kind of coming through all of my career. Uh, I would have to say that it's been more about me being a female versus you know being a male, but 
um, I think that that's also changing. I started out with the guard, I left and went into the reserves and then came back to the guard. Um, and so you always come home, so I, I feel like you know, the guard is my home. But when I think about the units, the composition of the organization has changed significantly. And um, that would be the, the big thing. And I think as we look at it over time, there's still some rock steady organizations that we have in terms of capabilities. But um, there's been a huge shift in, in the capabilities that we have from when I originally started and the types of equipment that we had then versus you know, what we have now. The proudest moment in my military career, God, there's so many. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd have to say definitely being the Army commander. That to me is my proudest moment. And because one, you know, I love staff, I, I love working on the staff, but being able to, at this level to get back to being an Army, you know, a commander. So, you know, being the Army commander for the National Guard, it, it's, it, it's, it's truly, I think, very refreshing. And it's allowing me for, you know, another time to be able to put my fingerprint on an organization that truly I've kind of grown up in. If I, if I really think about it, I've kind of grown up in the Maryland Army National Guard and it's allowing me to be able to put my fingerprint on something and hopefully to leave a legacy and to give people some type of hope as in, you know what, yes, we're going through some tough times, but we're going to get through this and we're going to come out even stronger. So we will come out on the other side even stronger. And so if I had Private Singh or, or Private Snuffy uh, sitting by me today and the advice that I would give them is that First off, I would just really start talking to them about my story because I too was a private at one point entering the military. And, you know, I can talk with them about how I made certain choices that gave me uh, many more choices to choose from. And I think some of those and things that I've learned over the way is to take, you know, each assignment as if it is going to be the most important thing that you ever do. Learn from it, continue to move forward make sure that you are in a continuous learning mode. Because if you're not in a continuous learning mode, then not only are you going to be stagnant, but the organization will go stagnant. And so that would probably be my, my biggest piece of advice to Private Snuffy is that you have to take every single chance to learn, to push forward, and to keep going because they too can end up where I am.